interesting program that I hope you will enjoy. I know for many of us, the League of Women Voters sounds like it's just focused on elections and certainly today's program gives us a little bit of an insight into what it's like to be an elected official. However, we are much more than just elections. And right now our action teams are extremely busy with everything from the environmental action team looking at, at climate control and what's happening with our local water supply and air quality. Our education committee is looking into partnerships with the Resiliency Task Force and what toxic stress does to our children and how we can break the school to prison pipeline. We have our um, fair elections action team looking at the national um, vote and we have a popular vote for the presidency and how that would affect us and is it possible to do that. We have a women's interest action team that's looking at Medicare expansion and whether or not we can get the equal rights amendment adopted. We are looking at a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. And I would encourage all of you to take a, a time to look at our website, check out what we're doing and see how you can get more involved yourself. It's the best way to really have an impact on what's going on in the lower Cape Fear. We will have hot topics each month coming up. This is the first one in 2021. And they again will cover a variety of topics coming from all of our action teams and our interests. So I encourage you to check each month and see what's going on and get yourself informed. On a very fun activity, you should have gotten a notice of tonight's pajama party. We will be Zooming with members from seven to nine with your favorite beverage, whether that's hot chocolate or a hot toddy. No. And you can have a chance just to completely socialize with members. There is no agenda. It's just a fun evening. So if you can do that tonight, we encourage you to join the party. And with that, I would like to turn today's program over to Barbara Burrell, who works in Brunswick County on our voter services activities, and she will introduce our speaker. And thank you again for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, before I introduce our speaker, Veronica Carter, I just want to uh, let you know, if you have a question for Veronica as we go along, please put it into the chat room, address it to everyone. And, at, and when Veronica finishes with her, her presentation, uh, Marilyn Prindy will ask the questions that have been given into the, into the chat room. So just put your questions in the chat room and be sure you address them to everyone. Okay, so as Catherine has told you, one of the major things that the league undertakings that the League is, of the Lower Cape Fear has done is to have as much as possible monthly uh, hot topics, hot topics about public policy issues uh, with events with local and state uh, leadership. Uh, and political leadership and the promotion of civic engagement have been hot topics in addition to policy issues. So then why did we invite Veronica Carter to be one of our speakers? Veronica is an exemplar of a woman in public leadership. She's gone from civic engagement to now uh, public leadership as a, a, a local official. And we're especially proud of her activism on environmental and, and equality issues throughout Brunswick County and the region more generally. Veronica Carter, as many of you may know, is a retired army officer and a formal civil servant with over 38 years of experience. Uh, Veronica moved to North Carolina in 2004 and worked as director initially of administration and logistics in the military uh, ocean terminal at Sunny Point. Since 2013, she's devoted her time to service to the community. She's been president of the Cape Fear Citizens for a Safe Environment. Uh, she's founder of the Southeast North Carolina Environmental Justice Coalition. She's a member of the North Carolina Department of Environmental Quality, Secretary's Environmental Justice and Equity Board. And she's co-founder and secretary of the Brunswick County Voluntary, Voluntary Organizations Active in Disasters. Uh, and now since 2019, she is an elected official. She's been elected to the board 
on the town board for Leland. She got more votes than anyone else. She was supported throughout the community. Uh, so she's moved her activism to politics. Um, and so again, she was the highest vote getter. Veronica ran on the platform of, quote, making it better than you found it. What that means to her and how she's implementing that platform is the subject of her talk today, along with how do you communicate your goals? That is the issue of messaging. So Veronica, welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Barbara. I hope everyone can hear me and give me a thumbs up if you can. Um, if you can't, just please uh, let someone in the chat room know. Uh, my name is Veronica Annette Carter. Some people think the A is for Anne. It's not, it's Annette. My mother was very specific about that. And uh, before I tell you, or explain to you what make it better than uh, you found it means, I kind of like to give you a little bit of background. I know some of you have heard this pitch because some of you did vote for me. At least, I, at least you told me you did. So I'm going to go with that. Um, and so you've heard it either at meet and greets or during the campaign season. But I think it's important to know where people come from to know how they got where they are. And so I am the only child of Earl Stanley Carter and Velma Pinkert Carter. Um, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I was born and raised in Brooklyn. Now, Earl is one, was one of 13 brothers and sisters from Bramwell, West Virginia, which is a small coal mining town in the southern tip of, of uh, West Virginia. And my mother Velma, or Jenny, as her friends called her, was the daughter of four, one of four children to another coal miner, but in a town called Kimball, West Virginia. Now Kimball is, and uh, Bramwell were both segregated towns. And so they both grew up in segregated, segregated South, <clears throat> excuse me, in segregated high schools. And one of their goals was to get the heck up out of West Virginia as soon as they graduated from high school. Now, they lived probably about 25 miles apart and they kind of sort of knew of each other. And there's a reason for that. And um, my mother's cousin, her first cousin, and then this is gonna get complicated and stick with me because it's West Virginia. Uh, my mother's cousin grew up with my mother and her siblings as one of their siblings. My grandparents raised him. And so he was kind of like my uncle. That's gonna become important in a minute. So my father, as he got out of West Virginia, he had a choice. He could join the Navy or he could be a coal miner. And his older brothers, since he was on the younger end of 13, took him down in the coal mine one day and he decided to immediately join the Navy. And that got him out of West Virginia and got him into Illinois. He had an older brother who'd been in the army in World War II who had settled in Chicago. So when he got out of the Navy, when he did his two years, he was drafted. So when he got his, did his two years, he um, went and lived with his brother for a while in Chicago, and then eventually found his way to New York to live with some older sisters um, who lived not too um, far apart from each other in Brooklyn. Now, my mother, who graduated from high school, went first to Buffalo, New York, because that's where her family had kind of settled. And um, I don't know if it was too cold or too snowy or a combination of both, but she decided to go stay with her older cousin, who was kind of like her brother in Brooklyn and help him and his wife take care of their children because they both worked in Brooklyn. Now that older cousin brother's wife happened to be my father's sister, okay? So he was one of the two older sisters he went to stay with. So my mother and father kind of ran into each other a lot at while my mother was taking being a babysitter and my father was going and staying with his older sister and eventually they fell in love and got married. So my cousin, who's kind of my uncle because my grandparents raised him actually became my uncle-in-law. So that gets a little kind of, and his children are my cousin on both sides of the family. Even though it's West Virginia, there's no incest. So we just need to get all of that out. But this becomes really interesting because they, they were high school graduates, both of them, and they'd grown up in a segregated South, but this was the 19, late, middle 50s. They actually got married in 55, and they decided that when they had a child, the way to get that child ahead was education. And my mother was, was focused on education. And um, for a number of reasons, I was it. When I came along in 1960, I was their only child, and it was never a question of whether I was going to college, but which college I would go to and what I would do with it when I got out. 
And if I had any doubt about that, my mother refocused my attention to the fact that I was graduating. I was going to be on the four-year plan for a four-year degree. And some of you may be familiar that sometimes four-year degrees take longer, not in my mother's house. They were going to be four-year plan for a four-year degree. But fortunately, I was, as an only child, somewhat inquisitive and um, had a lot of her attention. Now, my dad was a mailman. He wasn't the kind that pushed the little cart around and put the mail in the slots. He drove the mail from the main post office, if you've ever been to New York on 33rd Street, to all of the distribution hubs in the city. So he drove it to the distribution hub in Brooklyn, Queens, not in Staten Island, but Long Island. He actually drove it to JFK to the um, actual planes in the foreign. And this is back in the 60s. So this was a big deal. And he did that for 35 years. But if you've ever grown up in a big city, you know, it takes a lot to live there. So he, drew, he worked a second job. He became a, um, an aide at the schools part time. And so he worked at Macon Junior High School, Junior High School 258. My mom, once I was eight, old enough to go to school and would be out of the house so she wouldn't have to worry about a babysitter, went to work for the schools as well. So that way she could be home about the same time I was home. And she became a school lunch worker. But they discovered that my mom was very, very good at math. And they uh, started training her to be the assistant bookkeeper. And so she did that for over 25 years, um, eventually ending up at John Dewey High School, for those of you who might be familiar with Brooklyn but she started at Alexander Hamilton High School as a bookkeeper. So most of my time, because my dad worked two jobs, was spent with my mom, and my mom was determined that her child was going to do and see all those things that she hadn't seen as a kid. So she took me to museums, she took me to plays, she took me to concerts, she loved concerts. We went to all the concerts. And I remember one day we were walking down the street in Brooklyn on Nostrand Avenue, and there was this elegant looking African-American woman um, very well put together, very thin. And everyone was kind of crowding around her. And my mom said, we have to go meet her. I was about seven years old. And I said, who is she? You know? And my mom said, she's, she's a congresswoman. And she's the first black congresswoman. We're going to go meet her. Said, oh, okay. My mom said, you know what Congress is right now? My mom and dad, remember they, the only child they're doted on, we'd actually been to DC because my father had a brother who lived in Baltimore and we went to the Capitol and did the White House tour and all that good stuff. So this was something I was like, oh, she's one of those people that works in, the, in the, the big building with the dome on it. She's like, yes, okay, cool. So we go up and we get to, uh, my mom introduces her and tells her, you know, it's very nice to meet you. And she introduces me. And I remember this woman, she kind of got down to my level because I'm only seven. And she said, and what is your name? And what is your favorite subject in school? And I said, my name is Veronica and I, I want to be a lawyer when I grow up because I want to make things uh, different. I want to change people's lives because I know that the president just signed the Civil Rights Act and that's going to help our people. She looked at me and said, that's very good. Tell me a little bit more. She goes, have you thought about maybe education? I said, well, education is important, but I really want to be a lawyer because I also want to own a Mercedes when I grow up. <laughs> and she said, okay. Um, that woman who was so kind, and I remember the conversation we had and was so attentive to me, you might remember her as Shirley Chisholm. Okay? And so that was my meeting, my one meeting with Shirley Chisholm. And so when I went home, I got out my little encyclopedia. You know, we didn't have Google and, and couldn't look it up on my phone and started looking up Congress and how you ran for Congress and how you and what a big deal this was and that she made the laws. And I was like, wow, this is really cool. And some of you also may remember that she ran for president um, not too long after that. And so that became important. So all of a sudden I'm focused on hmm, this whole politician thing. This is kind of cool that there's a politician out there that looks like me and she's getting in the news a lot so every time I read the newspaper and I did it every day um, I look for stories about her and then lo and behold the the thing that bothered me though I will say this was that she wasn't my congresswoman we didn't live in her district but lo and behold a woman ran for congress in my district and so I got excited because this is now 1970. Okay, 1970s and feminism, I am woman, hear me roar and all that good stuff. And I had some really cool hippie feminist teachers in elementary school, New York City Public Schools. And so I'm getting excited. And she actually came, this woman, to speak to my sixth grade class. And 
she happened to be a lawyer. So this was even better. Because now I got to ask her questions about how did you get to be a lawyer? And which do you like better being a lawyer, being a politician? And why is that a good match? And this whole deal. And we had a great conversation. And about two, three weeks later, I saw her with my mother at the top of a subway station, giving out leaflets. She was running for re-election. And I said, mom, that's our Congresswoman. That's Elizabeth Holtzman. And my mom said, you recognize her? So yeah, remember I told you she came to our class? Let's go say hi. I can introduce you to her, as opposed to my mother introducing me to Shirley Chisholm. And I walked up and said, hey, Congresswoman Holtzman, remember me? And she's like, hey, how are you? Is this your mother? Now, my mother is freaked, as any of you who are mothers know, because she's trying to figure out why her 11-year-old daughter knows the Congresswoman and they seem to be good buds. And what exactly did we actually talk about and how much did I talk about? Because on one of my report cards, it did say that Veronica is very smart, but sometimes she has a little too much to say to her neighbor. Um, I realize that's now a badge of honor that I can wear on my report card, but it was there. So my mother's starting to get a little concerned, like, okay, were you polite? Were you, you know, what, what kind of things did you ask her and talk about? Why does she remember you so well? Did you talk too much? What's going on? But um, uh, the congresswoman said, you know, your daughter is very delightful. She's, uh, you know, so precocious. I had to look that up later. She just seems to have a lot to say and she seems to understand everything. And I'm really impressed with her. She's going places. And I, you know, I walked home really thrilled. Well, later on um, that year, I saw a congresswoman, I'm channel surfing and I'm going like this. Y'all remember that we didn't have this to change channels. We actually had to turn the dial. I'm channel surfing and I come across the Watergate hearings. And here is my Congresswoman, my bud, Representative Elizabeth Holtzman sitting on this big dais with all these other folks, including a black woman, Barbara Jordan, okay? And Bella Abzug, who I recognize from New York. And I'm going, wow, what's this? How are these women up here? Hmm, I think I'll watch this. and. You know, we didn't see back in when I was growing up, we didn't see a lot of strong women just speaking their minds because, you know, my mother, I love her to death, but my mother grew up in an era where women had to be genteel and, and polite and ladylike. And if you remember or are not familiar with Bella Epps, like you might want to Google her because that those <laughs> words you know, may not necessarily have um, fit her demeanor, not to say that she wasn't a lady, but she was rather strong-willed, um, as was Barbara Jordan, but in a very ladylike manner. And so all of those things were, I'm, I'm just taking this in as a kid. I'm enjoying it. Who as a 12-year-old loves to watch Watergate hearings? But for some reason, it just, it got me. And of course, we all know what happened at the end of those hearings. Uh, the president resigned. I was the one sitting there watching TV and ran in to tell my mother that the president resigned because she wasn't watching that channel. <laughs> um, and I was hooked on politics at that point at 12 years old. I thought this is a great thing because you can make changes in people's lives. During my lifetime, we'd had the Civil Rights Act, we'd had the Voting Rights Act, we had the Fair Housing Act. I grew up in a four-story walk-up apartment in Brooklyn. My parents lived there until my father moved down here in North Carolina with me. Uh, we were under rent control. I understood the importance of laws and how laws could make the playing ground more level. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to be a lawyer, not necessarily to, to drive the big Mercedes, but to make the playing ground more level, to make it more fair, because it just didn't seem fair that some people, no matter how hard they worked or how many jobs they had, just couldn't have nice things. They couldn't have a house or a backyard or a front yard. Um, they had to go uh, work extra hours in order to be able to buy a car. Uh, these were all things that were somewhat out of reach no matter how hard people worked or how, how sincere or good hearted they were. It didn't matter and it just didn't seem right or fair. But these laws, this thing called law seemed to be around to help people. And so when I went to high school, I was drawn to a magnet high school at Samuel J. Tilden High School in Brooklyn. And it was at that time called the Political Science Honor Institute. And I knew I wanted to major in political science in college. 
So I applied for that and was accepted. Um, they shortly after that changed their names to the School of Law, Politics and Community Affairs. And in the three years that I went to high school, New York high schools are uh, 10th, 11th and 12th grade. Um, we basically took seven years of social studies. So in high school, I actually took a class in constitutional law. I actually took a class in state and local government and got to understand how government was supposed to work. It's gonna become important. Think about that in a little bit. Hold that in the back of your mind. Um, still wanted to be a lawyer, still thought, you know, I was gonna go out there and save the world and uh, applied to colleges. Knew I didn't really wanna leave New York but because I really didn't think my parents could afford it. I didn't want to go spend up all their life savings. And, but fortunately got some scholarship money and my parents had saved up. So there we went. I decided I was going to go to Fordham University in New York. Uh, Fordham is one of the 28 Jesuit colleges and universities in the United States. And anything, anyone who knows anything about the Jesuits knows that they are basically the Catholic Church's educators. And so they spent a great deal of time on making a person a well-rounded educated human being, which means you get to take a lot of courses, which you don't think you'll ever, ever use all distribution requirements, but they make you take them anyway. And later on in life, as you grow up and get allegedly older and wiser, you realize, oh, that really was probably a good thing that they made me do that. So I went to Fordham. I majored in political science, but I, on the before I got to class, I suddenly got this um, card in the mail that said, hey, how'd you like to learn earn a little extra money and also be an army officer? Well, the earning extra money got my, caught my eye because again, I wanted to help my parents. My parents had taught me to work. I didn't have to work. They would, at times I think prefer I didn't work, but they taught me the importance of work by their examples mostly. And when I was in high school, every summer I had a summer job. In college, I decided I needed to earn some extra money. I didn't want to have to always go to my mother and father and ask for money. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, isn't she the spoiled only child that like, you know, could get anything she wanted basically? Yes, that's true. And I will admit to people I am spoiled, but I like to say I'm not a brat, okay? My mother um, had the best Jewish mother, black mother guilt trip in Brooklyn, okay? If she, all she had to do was give me the look. And you all know what that look is if you have a New York mother, that meant, sit down, shut up, and we'll deal with it later. I'll deal with you later. So I decided to investigate because I actually had been thinking about joining the reserves. You know, here I came from a family of military folks. I had uncles who were in World War II, um, who were Buffalo soldiers in the 92nd Infantry Division. My dad had been in the Navy. Uh, my uncle Rufus, remember him, the one who married my, my father's sister, had been a Buffalo soldier. And I'd heard all these great things and um, I knew they had benefits. I knew they had scholarships. They talked about leadership. I thought this could be a good thing for a lawyer, potential politician to have to learn how to be a leader. And there weren't many ways and places women could learn leadership skills back then. You know, this was the late seventies. There just weren't, you know, feminism had come, but there wasn't a whole lot of places where a woman could go in and be an equal to a man. So this intrigued me. I decided, okay, I'm going to go check out this ROTC thing. My mother thought my kid is from Brooklyn, New York. The first time they put her in the woods, she'll quit and it'll be okay. I don't have to say anything. It'll be good. Uh, they took us on a bivouac. You've all heard of that, right? They took us up to West Point, which wasn't that far. And uh, during the bivouac, it rained the entire time we were there. And we didn't have uniforms yet. So I had bought my cute little Timberland boots and had my jeans and, you know, I was absolutely soaked to the bone the entire uh, time from Friday night to Sunday when my parents picked me up. My mother saw her poor wet little child get off the bus and thought, yeah, this is it. She's going to tell me she quit right after this. And I greeted her and said, mom, it was great. You wouldn't believe all the stuff we got to do. We got to climb in trees and jump off of rocks and we sang songs. Those are known as cadence for those of you who've been in the military. Um, and, 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 and we got to, I got to take turns leading people and then I was a follower. And man, I, I, if I join, I get a uniform. And my mother, I guess, poor thing, just shook her head and went, this is my only child. Good grief, what am I gonna do? I did not know my mother didn't want me to join the army. 
till I had been in the army for 16 years. Okay. So she just decided if this was the course and path that I wanted to take, that she would be supportive of me. And I love her for that, having, having done that. So someone just wrote, just like summer camp. Uh, not exactly, but at that time, it kind of felt like it, you know, got to eat MRE or C rations. I'm sorry, we didn't have MREs. We had these things in a can from World War II. So I joined ROTC and the more I uh, pro progressed in ROTC, the, more, the less I wanted to go to law school. Um, I just uh, was sitting here enjoying being in charge of stuff. I'm still majoring in political science. I'm still loving politics. But I suddenly decided, you know, maybe I discovered that the, the Army had this fully funded law school thing that after you had served for like three years, you could apply and then they would pay for you to go to law school. I'm like, maybe that's the way to go to law school because law school is expensive. And in the meanwhile, I could do this stuff I really like, this leading and, and jumping from perfectly good airplanes and, you know, all this running and singing and um, learning management skills and, and learning how to follow. This, maybe I'll do this for a few years and then I'll have the army pay for me to go to law school. So that was the plan. That was the plan. But as I got, again, more and more into it, I discovered that the army was something different for me. It really was this place where as a woman, even though it still has its issues, you could actually be closer to being equal than you could in many jobs, in many professions on the outside, because if you are a lieutenant, you're a lieutenant. And if someone who is not as high in rank in you decides they don't wanna do what you say, that's actually something that can be punished rather severely. And so it was it, it equaled that playing ground, that thing I've been looking for my whole life where we kind of made things fair. And again, not to say that the army does not still have issues and did not have issues. Uh, at one point when I was in the military, uh, I was one of 69 women in my branch in, at my rank. The army at the time was over 500,000 active duty soldiers and there were only 69 women in my branch in my rank in the entire United States army. And quite frankly, I think I knew personally over half of them. And so that's, you know, it was a, it was a long road. But in the meanwhile, law school got put on the back burners because as I was in the military and learning about government, and I should say I was commissioned an ordinance officer, which most people think of bombs and bullets, ordinance in the military, in the army rather, is also um, supply chain management. It's also maintenance. And so I learned to be a logistician. I learned how to do supply chain management. Believe it or not, the same way the army does logistics is ex almost exactly the same way, probably better, then Sears does logistics, then J.C. Penney's does logistics, then any other major large corporation gets their supplies and goods and services to places and tries to fix machinery that's broken. It has life cycle management plans on how they replace equipment. That is basically the same. We may have different names for it, but it's basically the same concept in and out of the military, which meant in my little mind of being that blue collar kid from Brooklyn, New York, I was gonna be marketable when I got out of the army because I could take those skills that I just learned and make a boku buck somewhere else. So again, law schools became less important and frankly making boku bucks became less important because I kept looking at the government. As a logistician, you work with a lot of civilians. One, a lot of our supplies comes from civilian corporations. A lot of our people in the logistics field in the military are called Department of the Army or Department of Defense civilians. They actually give the stability to that supply chain. And so I worked with a lot of civilians and I realized, you know, I, it's important. This isn't just about getting um, 12,000 Blue Ranch Doritos to somebody in Queens, you know, was it Cool Ranch? I'm sorry, Cool Ranch Doritos to somebody in Queens. This is about actually getting a part to an Apache helicopter, which needs to fly over the DMZ to keep the North Koreans at bay. There's an importance to what I do. It makes a difference. It can make a difference in life or death. It can make a difference in helping people. We did a lot of um, peacekeeping and peacemaking operations back in those days in Kosovo and other places. 
And so those were all things that I began to realize that my faith told me I needed to do something that made a difference and helped other people besides just supporting and defending a constitution in the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and also more than just making money. Making money wasn't the end all. Don't get me wrong. I like money. I have nothing against money. I'm a big fan of nice things, but I do realize that it is not the end all. There are other things that are more important in life than that. So I spent my time in the army and I discovered, I did use the army to get a graduate degree. I have a master's in public administration because my plan was to get out of the army and work in some form of government as a civil servant. Uh, I did not know whether it was going to be the federal government. That was the logical choice, obviously, since I'd spent so much time in the, in the military. But state and local government always interests me. And the reason state and local government interests me is that if you understand politics, if you understand government, you know, it's almost the analogy is almost like the army. You want to go where the rubber meets the road. You want to go where the action is. And local government is where you can have an immediate impact on people's lives. The federal government's good. They do a lot of stuff, as we all know, that some of it never ever touches our lives, right or wrong. Sometimes it does touch our lives and then it takes forever to change because it's so big. But if someone at your local government does something, it's gonna have quite possibly an immediate impact on your life right here, right now, done. So how did I end up in North Carolina? Well, as I, uh, the army would have it, they actually stationed me back at my alma mater at Fordham University later in my career to be the professor of military science of the same Army ROTC program that I graduated from, which worked out really well because my parents were getting older and I didn't realize um, at that time that I wasn't going to have that much more time with at least my mother. So I got back to Fordham and started um, working on a doctorate, which I never finished. And there's a reason because Fordham didn't actually have a doctorate that I was that interested in, but because I was considered faculty, I got tuition remission. So I got to go for free. And for the first time in my life, and this is about 16 years in the military, I had a woman mentor. I'd never had that before. I had mentors, but they were never women. The woman mentor was the Dean of the business schools at Fordham because military science came under the College of Business Administration. Her name was Dr. Sharon Smith. And the first time I met her, she said, and so what doctorate program will you be enrolling in? So, well, with all due respect, uh, Dr. Smith, there really isn't one that I'm interested here in Fordham. She says, you don't understand. It's free. You're going to enroll in a program. You need to enroll in a program. You need to get some doctoral credits. Don't, don't blow that, that gift. So I now have 48 doctoral credits in social work, just for the record. I'm not a clinician, don't and know that I'm not a clinician. But while I was doing the doctoral work, one of the things you do when you're a doctoral student is that you learn to teach because you're expected to teach. And during that time, some of the professors said, hey, you'd be a really good adjunct professor here at Fordham because we don't have a whole lot of folks of color running around even as students, much less as professors. So why don't you become an adjunct, adjunct professor? So I went to my boss, who was a full army colonel, and said, they'd like me to teach on the weekends, if I could, a class in business and management. It's basically the same thing I'm teaching in ROTC. And he said, hmm, might not be bad for, for publicity to get people interested in the program if they realize, hey, we're normal. We have army officers who are like, you know, look just like you and me and that we're not some crazy people and that we're reasonable and we're intelligent. Might not be a bad idea. Okay, go ahead and teach. So I ended up not only teaching at Fordham as an adjunct, but then at NYU as an adjunct. And in one of my first classes as an adjunct, which was business communications, one of the students was a person who worked at the UN. And you know how you go around the room the first time you're in class and tell who you are and what you're gonna do and all that good stuff. I, at that point knew I was a few years away from retiring. And I said, you know, I'm a few years away from retiring. I have no idea what I wanna do when I grow up but I think I want to do something in logistics. And about a month later, she came to me during a break and said, have you ever considered working for the UN? I said, actually, no, I hadn't. She said, the UN is looking for logisticians right now. You might want to consider it. Okay, I'll keep it in mind. Well, as I got closer to retirement, 
I remembered what she said. I went on their website. How do you work at the UN? I went on their website, looked it up. And lo and behold, they were looking for a bunch of logisticians in the Department of Peacekeeping Operations. And the requirements were that you had to have a master's in, even, in either business administration or public administration, check. Uh, you had to have experience in running multi-million dollar budgets. You had to have experience in military logistics operations. 15 years of experience in military logistics operation. Ooh, check. And oh, by the way, the UN is looking to uh, do gender neutrality. So if you happen to be a woman and be qualified, we're probably gonna weigh that in, in your favor. Ooh, okay. So I got my resume out, dusted it off, fixed it up, sent it in with the application and thought I'm never gonna work at the UN. Didn't even think about it for about five months. About the fifth month, they called me up and said, we'd like to interview you. Whoa, uh, would you like to do it by phone? Or would you like to come in and, you know, you can come in in person, but we won't pay for it. I said, well, I'm in the New York area. Sure, I'd love to come in in person. They go, okay. So they set up an interview for me to go to the UN. And I got to tell you, I'm a kid from Brooklyn, New York, who once upon a time in those little yellow school buses went on a tour of the UN. And the day I went for my interview, there was little public school, New York City public school buses sitting outside, but I got to go through the employee entrance. And, and the only song that kept coming to mind was just the theme song from the Jeffersons, because if you don't know where the UN is in New York, it's on the east side. You know, it's like we're moving on up to the east side to a deluxe apartment. This guy kept thinking, man, this this is not real. But something in my, my head said, you're going to get this job. Um, my faith tells me that that, that was my faith saying, you're going to get this job. But I went ahead, I interviewed. I thought it went well. It was hard to say it was a panel of people. They asked me questions. I gave them answers. Um, I didn't really get a tour. I got escorted to very, if you, you trust me, even if you've been on a tour, you haven't been in the UN, you need somebody to show you around for a while so you don't get lost. And then they politely dropped me back off on the outside. <laughs> and that was it. That was in February. Uh, I heard from them again, December. They asked me if I was near a fax machine so that they could send me an acceptance letter. Now that was in the year 2001. Think about what happened in 2001 between February and, and December. I retired in May of 2001. They called me up, my, assignment, my branch officer called me up and said, you know, you don't have to retire. I said, I know. He said, um, as a matter of fact, we sent you a paper to sign that said you knew that you didn't have to retire. You could stay in for like four more years if you wanted to. I went, yeah, I didn't sign this. She said, you didn't sign that paper. I said, no, I signed my retirement paper. I thought that would kind of like give you all the hint that I didn't want to stay in. And if people are wondering, well, why don't you want to stay in? Realized that by the time I got to those 20 years, I'd already had three knee surgeries. I was kind of beat up. When I was a leader in those maintenance companies, remember I told you with the mechanics, there were many times I was, when I was a platoon leader, I was the only woman in my platoon of 78 soldiers. And I had to lead by example, which meant I had to run up front. I had to do as many push-ups and sit-ups as my soldiers, my 18 year old male soldiers. And so for my friends out there who are wondering why Veronica's had all these knee surgeries, why she's had shoulder surgeries, why her back is screwed up. Because at that time I was hanging. Okay, and I paid a price for it, but that's okay. I don't regret that. But by the time I got to 20 years, it was like, there is no way I am in pain. I need somebody to like, go look at me for real and call it a day. So I got out on the 1st of June and I actually went to work. This isn't really in my resume because I only did it for three months. I went to work for Frito-Lays, for, for uh, Frito-Lay potato chips. I And they were a subsidiary of Pepsi. I was a... Uh, a manager, a zone business manager. That's why I knew about the Cool Rancher, by the way. I had all of Queens and most of Brooklyn as my zone that I was worried about getting chips from here to there, snacks and stuff from here to there, and had four district managers and all this good stuff. And now remember, this is the woman who spent years making sure that um, she could put up a Ford area refueling point for, you know, a helicopter battalion, an attack helicopter battalion of Apaches. And now, I got people calling me because they don't have their cool ranchers and queen, cool ranch Doritos and queens. And it was just like, 
this, I, you know, they're paying me well, but I'm just not feeling this. I can't see me doing this for the rest of my life. I can't take this. So I quit and I called up someone who had, uh, had offered me a job and it was paying a lot less money, but it was at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. And I said, well, at least I'll be doing something. I still haven't heard from the UN. They haven't told me no. Maybe the UN will call. They tell me it takes a while because they get, you know, they're looking at candidates from all across the world. If not, at least I'll be working in the federal government. So I'll go work this contractor job at Fort Monmouth, New Jersey. Um, it's in operations. I've done operations all my life. It'll be okay. I'll work in a skiff, which is a secure compartmentalized area. I'll help the garrison commander write his operations orders and protect the garrison. It will, it'll be a breeze. I can do it with my eyes closed. And I started that job on September 10th, 2001. Okay, I lived in Jersey City, which is right across the Hudson from um, downtown Manhattan. When I drove to Fort Monmouth the second day, feeling pretty good because I felt like I was back home. I was back with the army on September 11th. I remember looking in my rear view mirror on a beautiful blue day and seeing the Twin Towers. Now the Twin Towers for me in New as a New Yorker meant something really important because that was my skyline. If you've ever been away from home and come home, when you land, you want to see something that looks like home. The skyline of New York City is my seeing something that looks like home. No matter where I was in the world, um, when I flew in and saw the Statue of Liberty, if I'm going up New York, Manhattan Island, if you were landing at LaGuardia, you usually get this view, um, see the Statue of Liberty, and then you see the Twin Towers, and then you look for the Empire State Building, and then it makes that right turn, goes across in Brooklyn, so then I can see my landmarks in Brooklyn, and then lands in Queens. So those Twin Towers were home, that, that iconic New York skyline. I didn't think about it. I just went, gosh, it's such a beautiful day. So I'm in my office. I'm talking to my boss. He's saying, how are you doing? Getting settled. I said, yeah, you know, this feels, this is natural. You know, I'm just not in uniform anymore. It's cool. I know exactly what's going on. And he comes in and says, hey, I have a television in my office. A, a plane just hit the Twin Towers. I'm like, like a, a little plane? Because that's happened before. If you're a New Yorker, you know this. So like a little private plane? He goes, I don't know. He said, come on, let's go look. This, Okay. So we go into his office and we're sitting there going, well, they're not saying much. I said, that's an awful big entry point for a small plane. And as we're sitting there talking about this, the second plane hits. And we're both retired army officers. He was a retired colonel and retired major. And we look at each other and go, crap. You know, we didn't say crap, but y'all get it. You know, and we went immediately to talk to the department of the army civilian who was in charge of us, the GS-14, and say, we have a problem here. And I did not go home on September 11th for three days. I could not go home because the New Jersey Turnpike was shut down, as was every other entry point that would get me to Jersey City. Because the Holland Tunnel, which is in Jersey City, was the way that they were getting firefighters into Ground Zero from New Jersey to help out. So I began to write operations orders to secure. We had to secure Fort Monmouth. Fort Monmouth is about 70 miles from Ground Zero, 70 miles south of Ground Zero in central New Jersey. It was, at that time, the closest active army post to Ground Zero. It had um, a two-star three -star general, um, commander of Communication Electronics Command, CECOM, was there. It had the West Point Preparatory School that was there. And so we, if you remember back to September 11th, none of us really knew what was going on, who was attacking us whether they were gonna attack something else. And so we had to secure the post and send people home and do all those things that we had trained for all of our careers, but never ever thought that we would actually have to implement it. So I thought at that point, that's where I was gonna be for the rest of my retired life. Um, I did, after I went, finally got to go home after three days, got a day off. I just settled in that this is what I'm just going to do. As a matter of fact, that Department of the Army civilian actually wrote a job for me. He found funding and wrote a job and said, oh, yeah, you're going to be here. You're going to be my new operations officer as a Department of the Army civilian. And on the day he told me that, that was the day the UN called and said, do you have a fax machine that we can send something to you? We have something we must send to you right now. And I said, okay. And I gave him the number to fax, and it was my acceptance letter. So now I have an acceptance letter from the Department of Peacekeeping Operations at the UN Secretariat versus a GS-14 
13 job. And believe it or not, the UN pays better. Okay. Not that money wasn't important, but it was the UN, you know? And I said, I'm, I, I took it into my boss. His name was Ed. And I said, Ed Devlin. I said, Ed, I just got this. I said, remember I told you I interviewed for the UN back in February? He goes, yeah. I go, they just called me and asked for a fax number and they sent me this and I showed him the letter and he goes, whoa, okay, well, I can't beat that salary. So I guess you're going to go work for the UN, huh? And I said, yeah. I said, how long do you need to, you know, get someone to fill this? And so I stayed there for about three weeks and started at the UN in December of um, 2001. And the UN was a two-year initial um, obligation, so to speak, contract, if you will. Uh, about three months after I started at the UN, my mother had a major stroke and ended up dying. Totally unexpected, totally uh, unprepared. Uh, it devastated my dad. They'd been happily married for 46 years. And meanwhile, his daughter has this new job at the Department of Peacekeeping Operations at UN headquarters, and she's been assigned to the Africa unit. And Lord knows there's no war, war countries, war torn third world countries in the Africa unit that might need a peacekeeping operation back in 2002. There were several. We had Sierra Leone, we had Burundi, we had um, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, which is the Ivory Coast. Um, we had Liberia a little bit later on. All of those missions I was responsible for and at least three of those four countries I've actually been to. And while people say, have you ever been to Africa? At that point, I was like, yeah. They're like, oh, it's so nice. That's so great. I'm like, no, I wasn't going on safari, boys and girls, okay? I was going to like a war-torn third world country where there was absolutely no government. Um, when I was in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, I spent three months there their post office just ceased to function. They hadn't been paid in three years. And interestingly enough, the mailman still tried to deliver the mail, even though they hadn't been paid in three years. And finally, after three years, they just got to the point where they went, I, we can't do this. We got to go get other jobs. We got to go try to feed our families or we got to go try to run from the rebels. And they just ceased to function. And so going to those countries and seeing what true anarchy looks like, seeing what true poverty looks like, seeing what um, autocratic rule will do makes you appreciate even more what our government can be. We obviously have problems. We have things we still need to work on, but we have this thing called the constitution that if you really read it, one, it can be changed. It has been many times since its inception through amendments, but it has this mechanism to do this peacefully and to do it somewhat fairly. And there are countries where that is still a concept that they can't even begin to wrap their, their brains around. In the Congo, one of the, I remember uh, coming good friends with a Congolese guy who worked for the UN. And when I would say, well, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself. He would start by telling me what tribe he belonged to. There's over a thousand tribes in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, thousand. And they all have different languages and cultures. And, you know, one day I said to him, you know, it's interesting that you described yourself by your tribe first. And when I meet people, they do that. He said, you know, in America, if you met, you know, you asked me where I was from, I said, well, I'm from, I'm, I'm from the U.S. And so we start off by saying, you know, we're American, no matter what our nationality is. We do start off generally saying we're American, especially if we're overseas. I said, until your country starts thinking of itself as Congolese first, and not individual tribes, that's gonna be a problem, I think. I think that's where we are in America right now too. We still haven't learned to put aside our tribes, if you will. We have to start remembering that we're all Americans first. Well, after my mom died, to get through my story, after my mom died, I realized that I, I had a dad who was just sitting there um, basically grieving himself to death. And the only person that he thought he could turn to and talk to was me. And I was on the other side of the earth, on the, literally on the other side of the equator, at least a two day plane ride away. And my heart said, this is not gonna work. My faith said, this is not gonna work. You're gonna have to be closer to your dad. He's gonna need to be closer to you and no, you can't bring him to war torn third world countries. So I made up my mind that when my two years was up, I would leave and that we, we would move out of New York and we would find some place that he would be comfortable with, that he would feel 
that he could call home and that I could go find a job because I felt I still needed to work at that time. And I was worried also about making sure he was comfortable and, and never had to worry about anything. So my aunt, remember that aunt and uncle, Uncle Rufus and Aunt Anne, had moved to North Carolina back in 1990. They moved to Whiteville. Note that I did not say Whiteville. I said Whiteville back in 1990. And they had since moved to Leland or actually unincorporated Brunswick County. Now, I know now as a legislator, but um, they moved to a, a portion here towards not too far from Leland. And because their daughter who had married a guy who was from Lake Waccamaw had gotten divorced and she had moved to Leland because her work was in Wilmington. So my parents always came to visit the particular aunt and uncle because it was a twofer for them. You know, my mother could see her her cousin, who was like a brother who she grew up with, and my father could see his sister. So we spent many Christmases, many Thanksgivings with them, Fourth of Julys with them, and either them with my parents or my parents with them, just because it was a twofer. Both parents got to see a sibling, if you will. So I figured this was the place that my dad probably would be the most comfortable with. He'd be, you know, he'd have someone besides me to live with. So we started coming down to North Carolina in, um, early 2004. We didn't tell anybody what we were doing. We actually sometimes would show up and not tell them we were here. We'd stay in a hotel for about three or four days and just drive around because in my 20 years in the military, I'd moved 11 times. Moving was like no big deal for me. My father had not moved in over 50 years. And the last time he moved, my mother was there. My mother was the assistant bookkeeper. My mother was the one who did all the 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 nitway, you know, stuff that taxes, bookkeeping, funds, investments, all of that stuff. So even though my dad was doing it, he wasn't that comfortable with it. And I did not realize until we actually put money down on a house how uncomfortable he was with moving. And we put we put our earnest money down on a house, and my dad called me six times within two hours at work at the UN asking questions and being concerned and freaking out. And I realized, okay, I'm going to have to stay with my dad. I'm going to have to be with him and make sure he's good and not do any work and live nearby, at least get him settled for the first six months. So that's what we did. We stayed off of Mount Misery Road. If you're familiar with um, this area of um, Leland and upper Brunswick County, he had his very first house in his life in his seventies off of Mount Misery Road. And it was a great move. His next door neighbor became his best friend. He found a church he was comfortable with. He started making friends. And one day he came home from the Piggly Wiggly with a flyer. And he, he said, you know, someone stopped me at the Piggly Wiggly. And they said that they're about to put a landfill a few miles from here. This doesn't sound right. And the landfill was going to be called um, Hugo New. That was the name of the company that owned it. And I'm looking at uh, uh, the Roberts family there and I think I can see Carol smiling. She remembers my dad. And my dad said, this, I, mean, I think I'm gonna go to this meeting. And at the time I was working at Fort Bragg because you know, I'm still trying to get into figuring out what I'm gonna do. And I said, well, good dad, let me know how it goes. I think my dad's not civic minded. My dad was one of those guys that he basically got his social network from my mom. So I thought, okay, good. he'll meet some people. It'll be okay and he'll come back and That'll be that. Well, he, he came back and he had more information. He had taken notes, which was for me, remarkable for my dad. And he said, I really think you need to try to go to one of these meetings. He said, there's some stuff here that doesn't sound quite right. So I think they're trying to pull some, some stuff over. So eventually, as I listened to him you know, over dinner and, and learned a little bit more about this, I finally went to one of the meetings and I realized, you know, he might be right. And it was a group, a grassroots group that had formed and they were at the time Brunswick Citizens for a Safe Environment and they were trying to fight it. And so my dad and I joined that group and my dad became an environmental activist in, and in his seventies, so you're never too old. And he led the charge, he went with us to Raleigh. He, uh, he and I talked many times, strategized over how we, you know, we thought we should approach things. And I was really proud that here at this late stage in, in my dad's life, he was suddenly starting to blossom and come out of his um, his little, I'm just a mailman and civil servant kind of thing and, and become really interested in what was going on in the community. But he ended up kind of pushing me to get into the community 
And the more I learned about the community, in this case, the town of Navassa, and the more I learned about what was going on and had gone on in the town of Navassa, I learned about this concept called environmental justice, which is really environmental injustice. It's where companies target poor, poor communities and communities usually of color, specifically to put industries and factories that will pollute their areas, that will make them less safe, less economically viable, and in fact, may actually make them dangerous because some of the things that they are dumping and leaving are carcinogenic. In Brunswick County, there are six brownfields. A brownfield is an area where an industry has come and set up and polluted and then abandoned and has not been cleaned up yet. There's six of them. Five of them are in the community of Navassa, which when my dad and I got here in uh, late 2003, early 2004, was predominantly, was about 90% African-American. Brunswick County is predominantly white, but in its predominantly African-American town, they had the majority of brownfields and were about to have this, what I saw was going to be a Superfund site. Well, it turns out they already had a Superfund site, but it just hadn't been designated. So they have a Superfund site and five brownfields, and there's only six in the whole county. That meant there was some racism, some, some vestiges of systemic racism still left. And this community had been fighting and scraping to get out of it all of these years. And I remember telling the mayor who at that time was not necessarily a big fan of mine because I was trying to keep this industry out of his, his town, um, Ulysses Willis, but I, I, we're, we're good friends now. But I remember telling him, I said, I know you hear this from a lot of people. I said, but I'm not gonna leave you. I don't know what I can do to help you. I don't know many people, I don't have any pull. I don't know if there's anything I can do, but I'm I'm not going to leave you. If you need me for anything, even if it's to like go pick up garbage, I'm going to be here to try to help you because no one else will and no one else seems to care. So I learned everything I could about environmental justice. And I learned that North Carolina was the home of the environmental justice movement because there were towns and they were, again, predominantly African-American, but also um, indigenous Native Americans and some Hispanic American communities that had these mega landfills and just had absolute pollution all around. This again, um, that, that little voice in my head that goes, this isn't right, you need to do something about it, just really resonated with me. And so I started getting involved in different movements. Um, I got in touch with Naima Muhammad, who is uh, the North Carolina environmental justice movement is, she is their president and basically co-founder. I got learned uh, the late Steve Wing, who was a professor at UNC Chapel Hill. I've learned um, to meet other people, James Johnson, who I now serve on the DEQ Secretary's Environmental Justice Board, who's a professor emeritus at UNC Chapel Hill. I got to talk and meet these people and say, what can we do to help this community? This isn't right. Why is anybody helping them? Leland, the town I actually live in, is like exploding. There are people beating down the doors to come down here. But right up the road, here's this poor black town and nobody's even, and they've got riverfront property. No one's even like talking to them. Or if they do talk to them, they wanna put yet another polluting factory there. This doesn't seem right. This just doesn't, this isn't computing for me. I'm having trouble wrapping my brain around this other than to think that there's some, some issues going on. So that's how I got involved in the environmental justice community. That's how I ended up here in North Carolina. And if any of you have actually stuck your neck out and, um, and when you take that leap of faith to join one of these groups and put yourself out in the public, it really is sticking your neck out. You know that once you get out there and start talking, more people want you. People want to, you know, like, can you join this? Can you talk here? Can you, no offense, League of Women Voters, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? And you have to like learn that no is a complete sentence. Okay, that no, I can't do that. I'm done. So I wanted to focus, stay, stay in my lane and focus. And at the time I was still working and my dad unfortunately had been diagnosed with uh, dementia. And I knew that at, at some point he was going to need more help and financially than maybe his uh, savings would allow. So that's why I kept working. But he passed away in 2013. And at that point I realized, okay, you were really working to make sure he was comfortable. You don't have to work anymore because you're already comfortable. 
Now you can do the things you like to do, which is to help people. One of the things that I had discovered along the way was something called Habitat for Humanity. Those of you who know Rhonda Bellamy, when I was fighting the Hugo New uh, landfill, Rhonda Bellamy still had a radio show on over in Wilmington and she would invite us to come talk about Hugo New and what we were doing. And, and while we were on commercial break, at some point, Rhonda and I would chit chat and got to know each other and became friends. And she said, you know, you seem to also be concerned about housing. I said, I am. My master's thesis was actually on um, women in need of housing, homeless women, because back in the 90s, that was a big thing. You know, people suddenly discovered all these homeless women that had been on the streets, but they were living in cars with their kids because they didn't want to, they didn't feel safe going into the shelters. A lot of those women were veterans, which also, you know, broke my heart that you could go serve your country and then just, this is what it came down to. So I said, yeah, homelessness is a big thing for me. Affordable housing is a big thing for me. I grew up in an apartment building. My parents, my father now lives in a house, but my parents never got to live that American dream. If I can find a way to help people get, live that American dream, I'm all about it. She said, you need to learn a little bit more about Habitat for Humanity. So I ended up joining the Cape Fear Habitat for Humanity board and become, became kind of an advocate for homelessness and, and for affordable housing and workforce housing. And there is a difference. Um, later, Cape Fear Habitat moved across the river. They have been in the northern part of Brunswick County and Brunswick County Habitat felt stable enough to take the whole county. So I became a member of the board of directors for Brunswick County Habitat. And so here I am, I've got environmental justice, I've got affordable housing and trying to get people in homes. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the people who are in those homes. Those people are hardworking people. They remind me greatly of my dad. I remember taking my dad to the first Habitat uh, dedication that he saw, and he was moved to tears. And he said, gee, I just wish we'd known about this in Brooklyn. Maybe we could have had a house sooner. And I'm like, no, daddy, me, you know, it wasn't meant to be back then, but you got your house. And now you got me, because you taught me these, these values, working to help other people get houses. And where did the make things better than you, you found it come from? When I was in Army ROTC, there weren't any other black cadre, but our command sergeant major, his name was Charlie E. English. This is when I was a cadet. Charlie had been in the army for uh, 29 years when I joined Army, army ROTC and he could like retire, but he stayed on past his 30th year. He got permission because he kind of became the godfather for the five black female and two male cadets who started as freshmen in Fordham Army ROTC and in four years graduated as second lieutenants. And he was there looking over us. He met my parents, my mother would make him uh, cakes and, and, and you know that kind of thing. And he just looked after us and he would teach us things that other folks didn't teach or couldn't teach. And I became drawn to the wisdom of that fatherly command sergeant major. So wherever I was in the army, I always looked for the sergeant major as a lieutenant. I thought just like Sergeant Major English had taught me things, the sergeant major would teach me things. And one of the sergeant majors that took me under his wing as a young lieutenant was Sergeant Major Muscovich, Mike Mus Muscovich. Sergeant Major Muscovich had these great sayings and we would spend time because they would make us go to the retirement ceremonies. I say make us, they wanted to make sure the grandstand was filled when people would retire every month. So we would, if we weren't doing anything, we'd have to go and sit and watch people retire. And during that time, Sergeant Major, it was like, if you all remember the old the old TV series, Kung Fu? We had Master Poe and the little grasshopper. I was grasshopper and he was Master Poe. Okay. And he would tell me things. He would share things with me. And these little sayings, he would say, never walk past a mistake. Because the first time you walk past a mistake, your soldiers are going to see that. And then it's going to become acceptable. Whatever the behavior was that they were doing, they're going to say, oh, the lieutenant didn't correct it that time. It's okay. We can do it forever now. Okay. He said, you want to be a good officer? Every place you go, make it better than you found it. He said, it could be little things. It, maybe it's a new paint job. You know, you go into a, a place and, the, and the, the paint looks crappy. You go get some paint, you paint it, make it look happy. He said, you clean it up. You give them a, a well where they didn't have water before. Or you fix their lighting and let you get your, he said, you got mechanics. Get them to fix the electricity and stuff and, and give them lights. He said, but you always leave it better than you found it. 
One, because it's the right thing to do. And two, it tells the people there that you care. And they'll remember you. Okay, every time they flick on a light or they get a clean water, glass of clean water from that well, they're going to remember that, oh, that's right, that army person came and fixed that for us. And that's going to be a good thing. He said, so if you always want to be good, make your unit, make every place you go better than you found it. And that kind of stuck with me. That makes sense. It's so simplistic, right? And it doesn't take a lot to make things better than you found it. It could be a little thing. It could be some of you go and help out with picking up the trash along the side of the roads. Okay, I appreciate that because you're making things better than you found it. Should you have to do it? No, but you do it and we remember you. I remember you and acknowledge you. So that's how you make things better than you find it. So how did I run for office? Well, I had kind of given up the, the idea of running for office. I actually liked being an, an, an activist. And that was a hard word for me as an army officer to embrace. Because, you know, I came under the Hatch Act. And some of you have heard about the Hatch Act. A lot of us took it seriously while we were in the federal government. And that means that you're not supposed to basically get really involved in politics. Nobody's not, we're not supposed to know what party you are. That's kind of why I'm unaffiliated. Because, you know, sometimes I vote, I hate to say this to you folks, but sometimes I vote Republican. Sometimes I vote Democrat. Sometimes I'm just disgusted with both of them and don't want to be bothered with either of them. Okay. And so I vote for the person and I vote for whatever that particular issue is. And I do my homework and learn what it is. And that's how I decide how I'm gonna vote. And that way, someone asked me a question, I said, well, why did you vote that way? I should be able to tell them that. This is long before I ran for anything. I just feel that that's part of being a responsible American, a voter. Voting is a right. It's the only right that's mentioned more time than any other right in the constitution. Unfortunately, the reason for that is because we didn't give it to everybody the first time. But nevertheless, it is the one right that is mentioned more times than any other right in our constitution. So I need to exercise it. I have voted in every election that I've been eligible for since I turned 18, including primaries, which was no easy feat because in the military that had to be done by absentee ballot. But it's important to do. I've, I've been to those countries where people literally were dying to get that right. So why on earth should I ignore it or not appreciate it? So I'm here, I'm working, I'm trying to make things better than I found it. And then in 2018, this storm came up called Florence. Y'all all, if you were here, you remember Florence. It, some of us couldn't get back. Some of us got stuck in places. Some of us lost uh, roofs, houses, lots of money. And once again, that issue of fairness and equity came up. Because while our neighborhoods, and I say our hate neighborhoods, Leland was kind of, you know, I, I was hearing about people were getting free batteries, they were getting hot meals, there were fuel trucks driving up, folks were getting the repair issues in that they needed. I went to, I called up the town of Navassa, because again, I have that relationship and said, how are things going, Mr. Mayor? And he said, Veronica, I need help. I said, okay, I'll be there. I got there. I said, well, tell me what you need. He said, I need, I need the people need food. They, their cars are underwater. Mm -hmm. There were literally parts of Navassa where the houses oh. and their cars were lost, total losses. They were underwater. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, how do I get there? What do I do? And I'm looking at my time. I'm sorry. I'm talking too long here. Yes. <laughs> but, yes. okay. but he said, what do I do? And we got him a distribution site. I ended up, I ran a distribution site. I wasn't planning on that, but some of y'all helped out with that. And I remember that. That was making it better than we found it. And I started realizing that there were local issues that I needed to address, not just the big issues like environmental justice, but a lot of local issues, fair housing. People wanted to stay here, even though they lost their house, but they didn't have any place to rent. People wanted to have safe air and safe water, which we've been fighting for for a while. But there was a division on what was going on. And an opening opened up on the Leland Town Council. Uh, three people, I, I'm, I'm a baseball fan. I go by three, so like three strikes are out, but three people came up to me and said, have you considered running for office? And then when the third one did it, I prayed on it and here I am. Okay. So I know that there are lots of questions. I'm sorry, let's go look at the chat room and Barbara, you tell me who I need to answer first. Okay, 
Okay, uh, well, Marilyn's gonna, we have a few questions oh, and Marilyn's gonna tell us the questions. Thank you very much. That's a fascinating story, but yeah, we are getting a little late, so. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. okay, you're wonderful. Okay, um, Veronica, thank you. Uh, first, Joanne wanted uh, me to remind everybody that the league website uh, address is in the chat and also the second link is how to join the league. So Catherine asked you, uh, Veronica, Americans seem to be very ignorant about our constitution. Do you mm -hmm. see a role for groups like the League of Women Voters to expand civics education both within and without school curriculums? Oh, Lord, yes. If you can, like, um, we could bring back Schoolhouse Rock and they could just start doing that, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm a bill or, or something like that. That would be so necessary. I think the biggest surprise I've had in elected office is how, and I don't mean this in a really negative way, but in the truest sense of the word, how ignorant people are about how government works and the different levels of government. And remember, I'm the person who took the seven years of social studies and the three years of high school, and as well as having the political science degree. And I'm still learning about government, but there are people who just don't even understand the basics. And they want to, I think. I get those. I get people who will ask me questions in between council or as I'm trying to shop at Harris Cedar, and I'm okay with that. Um, but yes, I, if the league could figure out a way to bring back civics, uh, maybe do some sort of a civics um, contest at the high school or middle school, start early. And um, then do some sort of series of here's how state and local government works. Here's how um, your municipal government works. Here's how you, your county commissioners. Here's the duties of your county commissioners. Um, that would be such a blessing to our our area and our region because it's obviously lacking nationally. Uh, but we we need that help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question from Joanne. Have you considered offering help to with vaccine distribution in our county or in the state? Um, actually, I have. Um, and I have been talking to people. And our problem is not the, um, they actually have some good plans. They don't have the vaccine. Right. Um, I've, I've talked to um, our health department, which is where the vaccine comes through. And they, they do have some plans even to put sites, which is what I was concerned about. Why don't we have sites here in the northern part of the county? Why does everybody, is everyone able who's 75 or over to even drive to Bolivia to get a shot? Um, but they have plans to expand where they will do the vaccinations. They simply don't have the vaccine right now. Uh, so the, and that they're not in control of that. If you, if you read the papers, the state is stuck with not getting the amount that they want. Um, it's just not there, unfortunately. But yes, I have been talking um, to both the health department as well as some folks in the governor's office to try to figure out what's going on. And the problem is there's no vaccine. Yeah, I can't, can't imagine that you wouldn't have offered your help after um, listening to your presentation. Um, Catherine asked, how does it feel to be an activist woman in Brunswick County? And are you um, spurred to look at state or national office? Well, uh, again, it took me a while to call myself an activist. I just do what my mother used to say, you just need to do the right thing. When you see something's wrong, that never walk past a mistake thing from Sarah Major Muscovich, and you do the right thing, that's suddenly activism when you speak up. Um, I, I realize I've been blessed for a number of reasons. The experiences I've had and the education I have has been to help other people, to be a blessing to other people. So if I see something wrong, I need to speak up. As far as running for other office, I just completed my first year as on town council. <laughs> uh, a lot of y'all put a lot of effort and faith in me in doing a good job there. So I think I ought to like work and focus on doing a good job there <laughs> and not worry about anything else for right now. Uh, this first year has been very challenging because of COVID. It was not anything like I thought it would be because of COVID, but I think we will be able to do a little bit more now that we know the parameters, what we have to work with, with COVID. Thank you. And I've got uh, two more. One of them might be a whole nother topic that we might um, consider leaving about the Greenway, Greenway Trail. But the other question uh, from Marlene is, 
Do you think most, if not all, equity issues are tied to um, autocracy? Autocracy. Autocracy versus democracy. So how do you think we can change this? Oh, I don't know that that's necessarily true. Um, frankly, there are probably equity issues even amongst progressives. I hate to say that, but you know, let's just call it call it the way it is. Um, equity is going to be a problem because we have not addressed a number of things in our country. I don't believe that we have reconciled our history and our past with regards to enslaving other people. We have not addressed our history and our past with poverty. The war on poverty just kind of die it, it, it's still going on but nobody's fighting it and so until you address those issues and i don't know that having an autocratic leader is is a good or a bad thing with regards to that i think democracy if it works can make changes because you can change the laws but you can also change the leaders that make those laws but you have to be involved no, I, I cannot stress how important it is to vote in every single election. I was elected in an off year, okay? You have to vote, all of those little votes, the board of, uh, the, to the, uh, the, the board of education, to uh, water and soil, all of those offices have, in, reach out and touch your lives in some ways if you live in this county. And so if you look and see that you don't like anybody who's running, then maybe you ought to consider running if it's in your wheelhouse. Um, don't run just to run because it is uh, a journey to run. It, it, it is stressful and it takes some time and you have to be committed. But if you think that you can do a good job and you can do it better than the person who's there, then get involved. But vote, vote, Tell, you know, do your homework, check out the person. Go ask them questions like you're doing me right now. And if they don't give you answers you like, then don't vote for them. Okay. okay. And um, there was the question about the Greenway Trail, Greenway uh, Blue Way Trail. Trail that the NAACP um, mm -hmm. proposal. The that is, yes. That's going to be a topic of the April Hot Topics. Mm -hmm. Wallace is going to present. So we're going to skip that. And the very last question. Well, I, will, I will tell you that I, I have um, worked with Brayton on that. And I'm familiar with it. And it does go through the town of Leland, but it also and Leland has uh, given the NAACP their support for that trail. But um, I think it's gonna be a great addition, one to our county, and it's gonna be a boom, I hope, for the town of Nevada. Oh yeah, it's, it's just amazing, that proposal. Um, the last question here, Veronica, is government still a required course in high school? And if not, how can we bring it back? You know, I don't believe it is. Um, not only is it not a required course, but I asked the question, I was a judge at a debate uh, for the American Legions a couple of Sunday, Saturdays ago. And I said, does North Brunswick ha have a, a debate team? And they don't. Oh. You know, remember when you were in high school? I don't know if many of you, and I went to public school. It's not like I went to some, I went to Samuel J. Tilton High School and PS 91 and all that. It's not like I went to some ritzy little um, private school. But those things should be in the curriculum. You need to know if you're going to speak up, it'd be good if you knew how. You know, there are techniques. I didn't just learn how to do this. This, this believe me, I've taken debate, debating classes and speech classes, and the military teaches its officers how to get up and speak publicly. And it is not required. Government's not required. Uh, speech or debating is not required. And those are all things that, you know, one of the things you learn is how to speak civilly ooh, with manners. We, we need to be able and how to get your thoughts across. And we need to be able to do that again. We as adults need to try to work on that. But certainly our children, if they're learning it in school, maybe they'll, they'll grasp it and, and hold on to it until they get to the adult level. But yeah, civics is not being taught. I, if you could urge, and remember I said Board of Education is an important uh, office to run for. Even if you don't have any kids or grandkids, this is why. These are some of the influences that you can make. Okay, um, I wanna thank you so much, Veronica. This has been great and wonderful history learning about your life and how you came to where you are now. Um, I did have one question, but I don't know that we have time, something we might think about for the future. You were telling that people should vote. 
well, I guess my concern is how do we get people registered to vote? Who's not registered to vote? And what are the messages we can give them? But again, that's probably something we need to well, think about so, for another, for, unless you have one thing. I, I, just real, real quick, I would say that um, I think people realize, especially after this election, how important their votes are. You know, and I tell people all the time when they try to go for activism, when I tell them to sign petitions, if you look at most of the, especially the local offices, many of them are decided by several hundred votes. In some cases, less than 10 votes. We've had vote uh, offices in our region decided by less than 10 votes, okay? Uh, look at the Supreme Court justice. That went down to the wire recounts and several hundred votes is nothing in the big scheme of things. You can walk through a couple of neighborhoods and get several hundred uh, signatures on a petition. So every vote is important and people have begun to think that it's not, but it does make a difference. And I think after what we've been through um, with this election in particular and how close it was, people should realize that their votes matter. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, could you stay on for just a minute after others leave? Uh, Bridget Tarrant has a uh, question outside of um, this particular issue that she wanted to ask you about. Okay, thank you. So, Thank you, everyone. Thank for you, coming. everybody. Sorry if I was just rambled on, but it's what it is. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much. So I hope you'll look at joining the league and come be part of all of this. See you at the next hot topics. Bye bye.